It's just another ordinary night shift at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The control room is quiet, except for the low hum of machinery and the occasional click of switches. Engineers move between consoles, checking readings, logging data, and preparing for the scheduled safety test on Reactor 4. Among them is the night supervisor, a seasoned operator whose years of experience have taught him to trust the instruments and follow procedure to the letter. Outside, the plant sits under a dark, starless sky. Yet, in just a matter of minutes, a series of small mistakes combined with a reactor design that is inherently unstable under certain conditions will ignite a chain of events that no one could have predicted. At 1.23 a.m., Reactor 4 was running at an unstable, low power, and operators were struggling to complete the test before scheduled maintenance resumed. Missteps in the insertion and withdrawal of control rods cause a sudden surge of reactivity. Alarms scream. Power levels spike uncontrollably. The operators try to stabilize the system, but the reactor design, a type known as RBMK, behaves unpredictably at low power. Two violent explosions tear through the building, blowing the roof apart and exposing the reactor core to the open air. The facility is on fire, the control room in chaos, and no one yet fully understands the scale of what has happened. Firefighters arrive within minutes, believing they are responding to a conventional industrial fire. They have no idea they are facing a reactor core in an open meltdown. Many climb the burning roofs, dragging hoses across debris. Each firefighter absorbs a lethal dose of radiation in moments. Nausea, dizziness and burns appear almost immediately, yet they continue their mission, unaware that the invisible hazard will ultimately claim their lives. Pripyat, the nearby city, lies less than three kilometers from the plant. Residents sleep peacefully, entirely unaware that radioactive dust has already begun drifting into the streets, contaminating homes, playgrounds and public spaces. Inside the plant, operators refuse to accept that the reactor has exploded. Their training has never accounted for such a scenario. They attempt to pump water through broken pipes, check gauges manually, and restore failed instruments. Each trip into the irradiated corridors doses the engineers and technicians with radiation strong enough to cause death within days. And Reactor 3, sharing a wall with the devastated unit, faces immediate risk. Flames lick its roof, and firefighters battle against impossible odds to prevent a secondary disaster. Visibility is near zero in some corridors, forcing engineers to feel their way along handrails, counting steps to navigate safely. Every surface is hot to the touch, and the air itself seems to sizzle with energy. Instruments fail repeatedly, forcing manual checks, which require them to approach areas no human should survive. The psychological toll is immense. By dawn, the scale of the catastrophe is unmistakable. Reactor 4 is now a gaping hole. The invisible plume rises thousands of metres and begins drifting across Ukraine, Belarus and eventually the rest of Europe. The city of Pripyat awakens to a normal morning, yet the radiation levels are already thousands of times above safe limits. Meanwhile, at the edges of Pripyat, Farmers tending livestock unknowingly expose themselves and their animals to lethal doses of radiation. Contaminated milk begins entering local stores. Vegetables are dusted with invisible fallout, and water drawn from wells carries isotopes that will remain dangerous for decades. The Soviet government is slow to respond. The Chernobyl nuclear power accident. It deeply affected the Soviet people and disturbed world opinion. Orders from Moscow are unclear, and local authorities are instructed to wait for instructions. Hours pass with no public warning. 
Families in Pripyat eat lunch in open-air markets. Children line up for ice cream, unaware that radioactive particles are already settling on their skin and clothes. By evening, symptoms of acute radiation sickness begin to appear. Firefighters and plant workers cough up blood, develop burns on their skin, and collapse from the invisible poison. Despite this, evacuation orders are not issued. It took a full 18 days before the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev made any public pronouncement on the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. The night of April 26 to 27 is a race against time. Engineers attempt to pump water from flooded basements beneath the destroyed reactor, fearing that accumulated water could trigger a massive steam explosion capable of leveling the entire plant. Three volunteer engineers enter these dark flooded corridors, wading through radioactive water to open valves and drain it. They know the risk. Every step could be fatal. Meanwhile, helicopters fly directly over the exposed core, dropping sand, boron and lead in an effort to suppress the fire. By early morning on April 27, radiation alarms had gone off in Sweden and Finland alerting the outside world that something catastrophic had occurred. For the first time, international observers realize that the Soviet Union is facing a nuclear disaster. Good evening, there has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The Soviets may have been fairly quick to acknowledge the accident because evidence in the form of mild nuclear radiation had already reached beyond the Soviet borders. It is not until hours later that evacuation of the surrounding population begins. Within hours, the city becomes a ghost town, its streets eerily silent except for the occasional emergency vehicle. The evacuation zone is initially set to 10 kilometers, eventually expanded to 30, still insufficient to contain the radioactive fallout. At the plant, the struggle continues. Fires burn across the facility. Graphite continues to smolder and molten fuel threatens to breach containment. Soldiers and emergency workers, later dubbed liquidators, are brought in by the thousands. They shovel radioactive debris from rooftops, construct sand barriers and pour concrete in desperate efforts to prevent another explosion. Each moment is a gamble with death. In these early days, logistical chaos complicates efforts even further. Many liquidators work in thin suits or improvise masks that offer minimal shielding. Sleep, food and medical care are almost non-existent. Every decision carries fatal consequences, yet the sense of urgency pushes men and women to act beyond exhaustion. Radioactive dust settles on their clothing hair and skin, creating invisible bonds of contamination that will follow them home and into the surrounding communities. By the end of the first 48 hours, dozens have already died from acute radiation sickness and hundreds more are in hospitals across Moscow and Kiev. In Pripyat, families huddle in evacuation centers, still unaware of the invisible poison they have encountered. Officials continue to downplay the severity of the accident, insisting that the situation is under control. But on the ground, the truth is undeniable. Countryman has now claimed nine lives and injured 299 others. He tried to explain what went wrong. The reactor is destroyed, and the land surrounding it is now poisoned for generations. These first two days reveal the stark reality of the disaster. Human error, flawed reactor design, secrecy and extraordinary courage collide in a deadly mix. The firefighters who climbed the burning roofs, the engineers who entered irradiated basements, the pilots who flew over the glowing core and the liquidators who cleared debris. They became heroes, many sacrificing their lives without recognition. Chernobyl in these first 48 hours, already changes the course of history. The disaster will shape nuclear policy, international safety standards and public perception of nuclear energy for decades.